Welcome to the September 2022 edition of What's in Bloom here at the garden. Every month we put together a list of plants that we think are going to last in flower for the majority of the month. We make a sheet with their photos, a little information about them, a map of where to find them in the garden. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those plants. Of course, there's lots of other things that are in flower that we don't select for this list because the duration of their flower is more ephemeral. Uh, but, you know, we're just going to highlight about 20 items here today. And uh, here we go. First plant on this month's list is Trichostemma Midnight Magic. This is a plant in the Lamiaceae or the mint family. It's a hybrid between our native woolly blue curls, Trichostemma lanatum, which is a coastal chaparral thing um, across the strait in, into Baja, uh, and a Mexican one. And it is much more floriferous than our woolly blue curls. That's what we like so much about it. It's really a tough, hardy garden plant that produces flowers over many months of the year. And again, this is Trichostemma Midnight Magic. Next up, we have Calliandra Sierra Star. This is a plant uh, in the Mimosa subgroup of the pea family. Uh, they commonly are called, these, these Calliandras are commonly called fairy dusters for little puff ball flowers. This one is a hybrid between our native Calliandra Californica and Calliandra Areophylla from the Sonoran Range and into Arizona. Uh, we find that this plant is much more desirable in a garden for giving you the, the pretty puffball flowers than our native uh, Calliandra californica. We just don't, we just have it look like a scraggly bush that doesn't flower very much, whereas this one seems to pop on and off a lot throughout the season, particularly in summer. Summer is just a nice time, not as many things in flower. Uh, so this is a very, very uh, tough, tough bush, but not a super hold, cold tolerant thing. We have seen some damage in, you know, a little bit of tip damage in the lower 20s. Nevertheless, a uh, wonderful plant for the garden, Calliandra Sierra Star. Right next door here in native land, we have Justicia Californica Tecate Gold. This is a selection of a normally salmon to orange flowered plant, uh, which has an unusual and striking yellow orange flower. Uh, Justicias are native to Southern California, uh, a little in Arizona, Northern Mexico. When we're down in Baja, uh, we've heard the locals call these things chuparosas before, which basically means hummingbird bush. Uh, and you can see why a hummingbird would like these things with a large tubular flower for them to stick their beaks into and extract nectar from. These are plants that are hardy to the low 20s, uh, that, to tolerate low irrigation really well, um, and are generally nice textural additions to the garden. I uh, would really recommend juxtaposing these against plants with, with larger leaves, um, but you know, every once in a while, uh, we're, we're playing the long game here with the boojum in front. Eventually, you're going to see that big fat trunk and the spiny foliage will be up above. For now, we got a little bit of a contrast thing going on. But again, uh, this is Justicia Californica Tecate Gold. Here we have Gasteria excelsa. Uh, this is a plant in the Aspidalaceae, a close relative of aloes. Gasteria, the genus gets its name from the swollen bases of the flowers, looking like a stomach, gaster stomach. So it's kind of a nice descriptive name. Uh, these are plant succulents that are from the southern part of Africa, almost exclusively South Africa, but there's a few that cross some of the, some of its borders. Um, they have the distinction of being among the few succulents that will really tolerate shady conditions, provided that they have good, good drainage. Um, and despite mostly occurring in coastal regions, we found out in the grand 1990 polar vortex event that these plants are tremendously hardy. Uh, a lot of these plants survive those sustained sub-20 multiple day temperatures with minimal damage where, while we lost over like five tons of aloes in this garden in that event and they were pretty much all melted. So Gasteria is big, bomber, tough plants. Uh, Gasteria excelsa is from the Eastern Cape in South Africa and when Brian Kemble and I visited it in 2016, um, at one locality near Grahamstown, we saw plants that exceeded four feet in diameter. So these things can get really big. None of our plants in the garden get that large. And in the cultivation, the only time we've ever seen them get that big was in, in greenhouses where they were getting pumped full of fertilizer. But nevertheless, the potential is there. Um, most of these things are little smaller fan-shaped items, um, but Gasteria excelsa has the potential to really be a focal point in the landscape, particularly in a shady place where you might not get away with anything else. So. Uh, Really nice one to, for the garden, Gasteria excelsa. Next up, we have Puya laxa, which is a bromeliad native to Argentina. Uh, many Puyas have very brightly colored, dense clubs of flowers, but this one 
has a more lax inflorescence, or meaning loose or not tight, the, referring to the sort of the wispiness of it. The individual flowers are sort of uh, pink, yellow, green, sort of pastel, candy corn, uh, hummingbird uh, attracting flowers. Um, this is a very cold hardy plant having survived the 1990 frost, so seeing temperatures well below 20 degrees for significant duration. Um, this is a plant that is resistant to deer predation. Um, and what's really distinctive about it amongst other puyas is the degree to which its leaf surfaces are covered by a woolly coating of hairy looking trichomes all over the leaf surface. It's very fuzzy looking. Um, it's not necessarily one that you want to pat on the upper leaf surfaces because of its rather pokey spines, um, but the lower leaf surfaces um, are kind of fun to diddle. You do end up knocking off the trichome, so we definitely ask you if you come to the garden not to, not to, to touch it too much. Um, but this is a nice textural addition to the garden and a thing that if you plant is likely to slowly increase from a single head of about a foot to a foot and a half into potentially you know, very large clumps over time. Puya laxa. Here we have Scabiosa ocroluca, uh, which is a well, you guys, you either call it a long-lived annual or a short-lived perennial uh, in the Caprifoliaceae or the honeysuckle family. Um, it's native to the Mediterranean and then east a little bit. Um, it has an interesting dimorphic growth habit where at the beginning uh, it looks like a broadleaf weed and then it transforms into this airy dissected growth bearing these sort of pale yellow little puffball flowers. And it makes a very nice, just light, soft, fluffy, contrasting texture in a garden bed. Um, it's very tough. It reseeds very freely. You know, if you plant it, you will have more. And uh, you will definitely find yourself feeling like some of those seedlings look like weeds. Um, but, you know, you can just thin it out where you don't want it and uh, let it move around the garden and make softness for you. So again, Scabiosa ocroluca. Here we have Mangave Blue Fountain, um, which is a hybrid between Agave Parasana and a complex Manfreda hybrid called Dit Da, which had, instead of just dots, it had stripes and dashes, um, which I think is a kind of a cute trait. Here we didn't really get that much purple, and at first we were sort of disappointed with the effect of the hybrid, but then it turns out that it has quite a nice architectural shape in the garden, and the sort of the ghostly, pallid, mauve thing that it's got going on ends up being a really nice contrast element. So, you know, you, you don't have to have every plant be the screamiest screamer in your garden. You often get a lot of mileage out of having some things that are in between killer and filler. And um, this is one of those, those types of items. Um, you can see the agave uh, parasana parentage, while it's not super obvious in the rosette itself, it's quite obvious in these giant fleshy bracts on the inflorescence. Um, which Agave Parasana has on its inflorescence to protect it from, from uh, cold at the high elevations where it grows. Um, we are introducing a selection of this, out of this Grex, out of the, of the various different seedlings that came out of this hybrid to be tissue cultured right now and introduced into horticulture. So in a few years, um, we're going to have one very similar to this out there for everybody growing their gardens. Mangave Blue Fountain. Here we have Aloe Carisburgensis. Uh, which is a species occurring across the border between South Africa and Namibia um, from the Richtersveld in South Africa up to the Karisberg mountain range in Namibia from which it gets its name. Our plants represent the South African uh, end of the distribution, the variability within this species, which uh, we just find have more aesthetically pleasing rosettes of larger and less numerous and wider leaves. And the thing that most people like most about this plant, despite the fact that we're highlighting its flower, are these wonderful stripy pallid leaves. Um, it's really a distinctive looking plant. I mean, again, it's, it's in the Allostriata uh, subgroup within, uh, within genus Allo. Um, and it's, it has the most distinctive flower, I think, in that, in that group, um, or at least one of them. Uh, it's uh, pink or pink to red. Uh, it has a little bit of a bicolor action at the mouth of the tepal tube, um, and it has some little stripes on the flowers as well. It's really an attractive thing. It's sort of an opportunistic bloomer. It doesn't have a really defined flowering season. It sort of just goes off when the time is right. But we've got three of them in flower here all simultaneously right now, so the time is obviously right. 
um, and this would be a, a real nice one to, to pause and have a look at here in the garden. We find that this plant is quite cold hardy, but it really needs excellent drainage, and it prefers to have the head of its rosette tilted a little bit um, so it doesn't accumulate water. It's a little bit prone to, to rotting in the center of the rosette. But other than that, really a wonderful bomber, striking focal point in the landscape. Aloe Caris bergensis. This is Erythrina bidwillii. Uh, despite having that Latinized name, it is in fact a cultivar. It's a hybrid between the South American Erythrina cristigalli and North American Erythrina herbacea. I believe that it was done in Australia um, in the Victorian era or the 18 somethings. It's been around for a long time. There's a bit of confusion about you know, what exactly it is, but it's one of the, the coral trees that's tougher. The coral trees are an old, old, old part of the pea family. They're really widely distrib distributed across Earth. Um, you find them in almost all the subtropical regions of the world, and the vast majority of them we cannot grow outside here. Um, but this one uh, is, is really a uh, show-stopping plant and has proven to be hardy off of the roots year over year. So in a tropical or subtropical place, you know, like in Florida, you might see one of these things growing as kind of like a small scraggly tree that produces a large push of new leafy growth every warm season, um, but really, you know, maintains limbs and trunks above ground. Here, what we get is sort of a big tuberous looking base, almost like a caudex of all the, the built up callus tissue from, you know, cutting it back. Uh, we, we see that this, flower, this plant usually flower for us from May through October, and then you know, after the leaves get dinged by the frost in November, we tend to cut it back down to the base where it sits as sort of this contorted dormant lump until bursting back into growth in the springtime. Um, these are really nice hummingbird attracting flowers, uh, very dramatic, and it uh, is making a very nice flush of new flowers right now, new buds right now for the month of September. Erythrina bidwillii. Here we have Mangave bloodspot. This is a cultivar um, hybrid between a Manfreda and uh, Agave macroacantha, um, a small agave from southern Mexico, mostly in Oaxaca. Uh, and it's a very cute little purple spotted rosette. Essentially, that's what we like about these Manfredas um, or the Mangaves. You get the purple spotting from our Manfredas and you get the nice architectural shape of an agave. So you have these, these little color pops um, that are little sculptural items. And then of course they also have nice, nice flowers. Manfreda flowers tend to be more lax or more spaced out than agaves and, and oftentimes a little bit less dramatic. Um, but nevertheless, this is a cute little, a cute little spray. Um, we find that the, the one downside to uh, mangaves in the landscape is that in addition to inheriting the beautiful purple from the Manfreda parent, mangaves also inherit the, uh, the habit of flowering much faster. So you tend not to get as long with the plant as a, an architectural thing in your garden, um, and you tend to get more flowers. So if you know agave flowers are your thing, uh, mangaves are for you. Um, there have been a, quite a lot of these things introduced um, by a breeder um, from the upper Midwest, uh, Hans Hansen, in the last decade or so. Um, but this is one of the older ones, um, pretty widely available and uh, a very nice plant for the garden. Mangave blood spot. We're standing in front of Opuntia ficus indica, or one of the various different clones of that species that we grow here in the garden. And we're not actually highlighting the flowers on this one, we're highlighting the fruits this, this time. Uh, and in uh, anticipation of our upcoming fruit tasting tour in the fall. Um, we'd like to draw your attention to these delicious things. Opuntias are commonly referred to as prickly pear cacti, um, and that refers to the fruits, which are actually referred to as tunas, T-U-N-A, just like the fish. Um, and most of the species have quite a lot more spination than Opuntia ficus indica. So Opuntia ficus indica is the one that you'll see cultivated for the most part for the production of the fruits or for feeding to livestock. Um, it's not just the fruits that you can eat. In fact, in the springtime or early summer when a new, the year's new pads are emerging, and these pads, they're not leaves, they're sort of flattened, adapted stem segments. Um, you can eat the newly emergent pads and that is what they call nopal or nopales. Um, the texture there is sort of like a, you know, a green bean or a, a pea or a bell pepper or something like that. It can be really nice in, in a lot of dishes. And I think we're going to see that these 
these plants, particularly you know, this specific species of Quintia ficus indica, are going to be really important for food production for humans and animals alike as the planet gets hotter and drier because you're able to produce an awful lot of edible material with a very small you know, resource and environmental footprint. Um, and uh, you know, one thing to be aware of with the Opuntias, so I mean, you're not going to be able to see it here, but um, they're, they're, they're covered, the aerials, the dots on the, on the pads are covered by these little fine spines called glockids, which can be quite irritating. And you, know, you want to make sure you clean those off before you, you try to eat any prickly pears that you might be interested in. Um, we have quite a uh, number of different Opuntias, um, both ornamental and uh, edible ones in the nursery right now. So um, if you're interested, you know, come, come check that one out. Again, this is Opuntia ficus indica. Here we have Ferrocactus potsii, uh, which is a distinctive ferrocactus from northern Mexico. Uh, the genus Ferrocactus uh, are often referred to as barrel cacti, um, or in Spanish, biznagas. Uh, this one has uh, a really attractive fruit, and that's actually what we're highlighting here. The flowers are mostly gone, and I don't see any more, more buds coming, um, but these bright yellow little pineapple looking fruits are definitely the most ornamental cactus fruit that I can think of in, in the garden. Um, really a stunning landscape specimen. These plants are quite old. It takes a very long time. These plants are older than I am here. Um, it takes quite a long time to get them this large, um, but nevertheless it's a hardy and moderately robustly growing plant in, in the landscape here in our climate, as long as you give it lots of sun and good drainage, you should be off to the races. So again, Ferrocactus potsii. I'm standing under the shade of our silk floss tree, Seba speciosa, formerly Coricea speciosa, uh, which is a tree from South America. Uh, the locus of its distribution is kind of like the intersection of Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, but it actually goes all the way to west into Bolivia. Um, it is mostly tropical and subtropical. And this is one of these things that Mrs. Bancroft had to kind of do Herculean winter protection antics to get it to establish until it was mass, had enough mass that it could withstand a, a cold winter. Um, but she did, and it's really one of these particularly impressive testaments, monuments to her, her green thumb and her persistence and will. Um, our tree tends to only flower for us in the fall. Uh, it, it goes deciduous, it drops its leaves, or at least, mostly drops its leaves and then starts spitting out masses of these five sepaled, five petaled flowers, um, which have now gotten it moved into the Malvaceae or the mallow flower for the character of, the, of those, those flowers. Um, it's really a wonderful tree for, uh, for more temperate or more coastal adjacent climates. If you're in Southern California, this thing will bloom for like three to six months every year. Um, but here we tend to get six to eight weeks in the fall, um, but you know, it's a really big show. It's this huge canopy of brilliant pink and white flowers, and we're always pleased to see it do its thing. So uh, come, definitely come, come get an eyeful of this one while it's going, Seba speciosa. Next to me is Echeveria mauna loa. Um, this is a hybrid of Echeveria gibiflora done by a gentleman named Dick Wright down in Southern California in San Diego County. Um, where he was really working to amplify the crenulations, or shall we say ruffles, and carunculations, or bumps on the leaf surfaces of these plants. So he started with um, Echeveria gibiflora, wild forms that had, you know, a little bit of wiggle and a little bit of bumpiness, and over time was able to select the most freakish seedlings and cross them with each other and make these things which I like to affectionately describe as psychedelic cabbages. Here in Walnut Creek, the extreme heat of our summers um, blows, washes the color out of these things. In coastal conditions, you would be seeing a vibrant blue color and bright magentas and pinks adorning all of the ruffles and, and bumps. Um, but, you know, here it is. We've gone through a whole lot of heat and it's looking kind of pallid. Um, these are plants that, uh, you know, here I'm in a bed that we protect. Um, the plants that here in Walnut Creek don't tend to be long-term successes in the landscape in an exposed position um, and tend to be much easier to maintain and keep and enjoy in pots. Um, like all of these large ones, you do need to occasionally behead them um, and uh, to get them going again. As soon as you start to see their, their stem constricting, that tells you that the plant is not doing as good of a job wicking nutrient 
and water from its roots up to its head. And so you should cut it off in the warm season and give it a new chance to, to get going again. Uh, these are quite desirable collector plants and quite widely, quite widely grown. Um, there's a whole lot of these kind of psychedelic cabbage, Echeveria, Giboflora hybrids these days. But Mauna Loa is a tried and true uh, old one that uh, never fails to disappoint. Echeveria Mauna Loa. This is Cyphostemma jute, which is a caudiciform in the Vitaceae, or the grape family. This one is native to Namibia, and sometimes it's called Namibian grape. Um, the thing that we like most about it is the large swollen stem storage apparatus there, um, but it also has quite attractive leaves and these delicious looking gelatinous fruits, which you really, really don't want to eat. I don't think that, that they would kill you, but you would have a decidedly bad time if you ate them. These things are poisonous. Um, surely there's some little animal out there whose digestive tract can take this, and you know that's how come the, the plant is presenting it in that bright, colorful way for whom, what, whom, whatever the little local seed distributor agent is. Um, but uh, you know, don't use your own digestive tract to uh, scarify these seeds. Uh, it'll be a it'll be a bad move. Um, this is one of the very few caudiciform plants which we can reliably grow outside here through a winter. In fact, um, with a tiny bit of microclimatic uh, massaging, they're actually able to grow these things in Davis as well, which is about as far inland as I've seen it. Anybody get away with something like this? Um, in time, uh, at great time, perhaps longer than the scope of, of human lifetimes, these plants can grow to be the size of cars um, at the base of their stem, which is really kind of amazing. Cyphostemma jute, fabulous fat thing. This is Echeveria gigantea, which is a crassulaceous rosette native to the state of Oaxaca in Mexico. Um, my personal opinion is that really this ought to be described as a subspecific variant of Echeveria gibiflora because it flowers at the same time, it has the same flowers. Its overall uh, leaf morphology fits well within the variability expressed in that species, but we're still referring to it um, as its own species, and it is quite distinct. It has, it's, a, it's a fatter leaf than um, almost any other thing in the Echeveria giboflora group, and it really is quite large, growing to about two feet wide. Um, cultivationally, we find that this plant um, here in Walnut Creek, where we see the 20s in Fahrenheit every year, is not one that we want to have out in the open. It's one where we'd like to have a little protection over. Um, if you are in coastal California, this is a plant that you can grow outside, outside no problem. But here, a little protection is better. Uh, it flowers in the fall, and uh, we find that because it, the head is so heavy and it grows a long stem like most of the really large Echeverias do over time, that it benefits from being beheaded, uh, having the, cutting the head off every other year, every third year at the very most, so that it doesn't get too hoppy, uh, too top heavy and, and fall over. Uh, Echeveria gigantea. Here we have Allopulcherima. Uh, it's a cliff dwelling species from central Ethiopia, um, where it almost exclusively inhabits sheer cliff faces adjacent to waterfalls. So it likes air moisture. Um, probably more than we're able to provide here, and it oftentimes looks a little bit desiccated because it doesn't have a waterfall next to it here. Um, but it does have quite impressive, quite impressive flowers, a beautiful leaf with a orange, orange or red margin on it. The individual that we have here is quite large. Usually it's a smaller plant, more like you know three feet, two and a half feet in diameter. But here we got one that's that's over four feet wide, and it seems to have a little bit of, of mind of its own. Um, we planted it, anticipating that it would grow towards the sun that way, but here it is growing to the northeast, away from the sun for whatever reason. Um, it does, growing that way, at least afford you a nice look right into the center of its radially symmetrical rosette. Um, this is a close relative of the super rare uh, and desirable Aloe encoparensis, also from high elevations in central Ethiopia. Um, if you're interested in growing this plant locally here in in Contra Costa County in inland places, it's one that's going to want a little bit of protection. Um, it's a species that you can get away with in more moderate coastal places. Aloe pulcorima. I'm sitting here among several clumps of aloe cooperi. Um, aloe cooperi is amongst the grass aloe group within genus aloe, which pretty much exclusively come from the eastern side of South Africa, where it rains in the summertime, it's dry in the winter. Basically, 
hot and tropical and moist, the opposite of what we have going on here in the warm season. And so there are very few of these grass aloes that we can reliably grow here in California. They tend to just not like it and they tend to be little finicky greenhouse things. But this is, but this alacuperi, this particular form of it, it has, has been a very robust and very successful plant for us in the landscape, and almost shockingly so. Um, I've never seen one, an individual uh, that grows as big as this particular form does, like all the aloe cooperi that I've seen before have been shorter things. Some of these inflorescences are almost five feet tall. Um, and we find that this is actually a super useful plant in a landscape when you're dealing with those narrow planting areas um, where you where you have like a little gap next to next to a house or something like that and you need a plant that's going to stand up some but that is also uh, not going to grow too wide and this is a really wonderful plant like that you know in, in, in the case of this bed we've used it as a sort of a vertical element and a textural element at the top of a mound and it works really well for that also um, the flowers themselves individually are quite quite big and the, the bicolor is charming. Uh, we're really chuffed with this thing. When we first when we were sent the seeds, we kind of thought, eh, a grass aloe. But it turned out to be a very, very charming garden subject and one that we very much look forward to growing more and getting out into cultivation in a broader, a broader sense. Aloe cooperi. Here we have Grevillea King's Fire, which is a new cultivar um, to the United States, which is extremely floriferous. It was part of a series all titled King something or other, King Celebration, King's Rainbow. And some of those other ones had individual flowers, which are a little bit more exciting than these, these ones are, but none of them produce this quantity or with the frequency. This plant flowers for at least 10 months of the year, perhaps even 11. Uh, it, it is just a ludicrous amount of flowers. And when we first received it, they said they told us that it was gonna be four to five feet wide. And quite clearly, it's about double that, those proportions. So it is, it is good to approach the size descriptions of a lot of these Proteaceae with a healthy dose of skepticism. Um, but if you would like a large, almost ever blooming, sort of fine needle textured plant for the garden, Grevillea King's Fire is a really wonderful option to consider. Grevillea King's Fire. This is a dwarf form of Xanthorea quadrangulata. The xanthoreas are uh, commonly referred to as Australian grass trees. They're not grasses, um, but they do look grassy. Uh, most of them end up growing a bit of a trunk that can be kind of anthropomorphic. Um, but this particular form of xanthorea quadrangulata stays very small. Um, the large plant that Mrs. Bancroft planted in sometime in the past and grew it to be a large thing from which we grew these, these seedlings um, has doesn't seem to have any of its, of its heads wider than about three and a half or four feet wide, whereas this species usually is about seven, six or seven feet wide. So it's cool to have a smaller one. Most of these xanthoreas um, spit out their kind of fabulous cattail flowers in the springtime, but this one flowers in the fall. Um, and it has a little bit of a sort of almost like a, a chartreuse green color underneath the pale white flowers which stick out from the cattail. Um, it's quite attractive to pollinators, the bees are the honeybees are busy stripping all the all the pollen off uh, right now. And uh, you know, one of the things that I there's several a number of things that I like about these things. One of the things I like most about them is that the flowers look cool, and then the dried inflorescence continues to look cool, like a nice architectural cattail. Uh, and the rosette itself is, for me, um, or the Rosanthorea rosettes in general, are the most dynamic. Uh, grass-like architectural rosettes. They have a certain bit of kinetic movement to them that's more interesting in the wind than anything else like that. Um, and they end up being really, 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 really wonderful plants in the garden. Um, after being established, these things will go with quite low water um, and they are very long-lived plants. Some of the species can live for hundreds of years. Um, so, you know, we like anything that we can plant in the ground and that can become an heirloom for future generations. Uh, and this is definitely one of them, Xanthorea quadrangulata. Here we have Glottophyllum oligocarpum, which is a mesem in the ice plant family. Um, it hails from the Little Karoo in South Africa. Glottophyllum, the genus, means tongue leaved, which is a really nice descriptor for this, this genus, um, seeing as the distichously fan-shaped arranged pairs of leaves look like little pairs of tongues. Um, they have cute little, little bright yellow ice plant flowers that we tend to get mostly in the fall. Um, 
The one negative thing that I can say about these plants is that our local population of mourning doves like to peck them, um, think that they're yummy, and they teach, they, they have, there's an inter intergenerational teaching that happens between the dove generations where they show the young ones, so here's a yummy thing to come peck at the Ruth Bancroft Garden. Um, so that is a slight annoyance, but otherwise these are very hardy, very tough plants that will grow in full sun, tolerate every bit of cold that we can throw at them, and slowly appreciate over time into more and more charming little, little clumps of, of, of mimicry foliage. Um, and it's a well enough acclimated thing to our climate. As you can see, that there's a volunteer seedling here. So you know, any succulent that will, will germinate will volunteer on its own from seed in the garden is usually one that's really well suited to grow in that climate. Um, and Glottophyllum oligocarpum is one of those for us here. And that concludes September 2022's What's in Bloom list. Uh, if you'd like more information about our plant collection, uh, or you'd like to find out about the further educational opportunities that we offer, check out our website, ruthbancroftgarden.org. Uh, we'd love to see you visit us in September and, and see this, this whole list of things. But if you're further afield, you know, follow our social media and you'll be able to see lots of pretty pictures of these things while they're popping. Thanks for joining us.